Hey guys, welcome back. Well, I've moved on from my ED-102 and now I have my Celestron C9.25 on the EQ6R mount and looking forward to some imaging here in Galaxy Season, but much to my chagrin, I'm getting very inconsistent focus results using the Nina autofocus routine in this particular scope, which I believe this is the first time when I've actually subjected this scope to the Nina autofocus routine. So I'm wondering what's up. And just as an aside, for those of you who are Bob Seeger fans, I think he might have been an astrophotographer because I too feel like I'm working on mysteries without any clues. Just as a little background, the first thing I do whenever I get a new focuser and put it on a telescope, I do go through this characterization test where I put the Batonoff mask on and then run the focuser from out of focus, through focus, and then turn around and come back the other way, back through focus, and then back out of focus again on the other side. And as I pass through the critical focus zone, the offset between the two lines is the backlash of, in this case, 20 steps. So this is how I characterize the backlash of my refractors and this SET. The slope of the line essentially tells me the small or minimum step size, and the autofocus step size is about 5 to 10 times the minimum step size. So I get all of this information by doing these series of tests with the Batonoff mask and it generally provides a very good idea for me to characterize these parameters in autofocus uh, routine. So I generally have a pretty good idea of what to put into an autofocus routine. Here's what a good focus looks like. This is taken with one of my refractors and what we're trying to do is to generate a series of images through the autofocus algorithm. It generates an image, evaluates the star shape, in this case half flux radius, and then it fits a hyperbolic curve to the data. And if the curve looks like the data, then you're good to go. And as you can see here, it's, a, it's an absolute great fit. Now that's what I'm trying to get with my SCT, but it's not really working out. But as a general rule, what you wanna do when you're setting up your autofocus runs is to make sure that whatever the minimum focus here is, you wanna have the maximum out of focus half flux radius to be about two to three times of that minimum focus number. I tend to aim for a total of about nine to 11 points to characterize this curve. I don't take more than one point per focus or position. I let the hyperbolic curve fit take care of the error generally it's pretty good at that. I suppose there could be some special cases where you might want to try taking multiple points for a given focus or position, but as a general rule, I think that's less efficient than just collecting more points along the curve. Be sure to use the overshoot backlash compensation method by entering in a number for backlash that's larger than, maybe twice as large as what the actual backlash is. In my case, backlash is actually 20 or so for this SCT focuser and I'm using something on the order of 40 steps in my backlash compensation. And then finally, the HFR is gonna vary for the different scopes that you might have. For a, a refractor where the F ratio is five, I'm getting a half flux radius, an optimal half flux radius of 2.2, whereas the ideal half flux radius is given by this uh, formula here of 0 0.471 times the wavelength of light obviously depends on the filter, times the focal ratio of the scope that you're using. For this particular refractor, you can see the optimum focus is about 2.2. And so if I scaled this up with, say, an F7 scope, then I would expect to see the optimum focus somewhere around 3. And for my F10 SCT, I would expect to see the optimum focus around 4.4. Be, don't be surprised if you're getting a larger half-flux radius out of your SCT than you are with your uh, small aperture refractor just because of the scaling that goes on with the focal ratio. But in the end, if you get a good curve and it matches the data, you can trust the focus number that it gives you. That's what I want to see out of my SCT. I've been seeing it a lot out of my refractors, but out of the SCT, I'm getting very wanky results here. I tend to see a lot of variability and lower values for HFR on one side of focus than I get on the other side. On this side of focus, the numbers are not that bad. But on the other side of focus, I'm getting this depressed series of numbers. And then when you try to fit the hyperbola to the curve, and you can always fit a hyperbola to a data for the most part, it tends to shift the hyperbola, the bottom, the, the optimum low point here of the, of the hyperbola off to the right in this case. And so I'm missing the optimum focus point. Of course, the stars are a bit different with a 
a star field provided by an SCT than they are for a refractor. As a general rule, we're looking at galaxies. Uh, there are fewer stars in our galaxy between us and the galaxy we're looking at. That's why we can see the galaxy. But there's also fewer stars because your field of view is much smaller. The stars are uh, tend to be larger, again, because the focal ratio of an F10 scope is larger than an F5 refractor. And the stars tend to be fainter because it is a slower scope. And if you try to compensate for that by using a longer exposure, you crank in some eccentricity in those stars because of gear train mechanics in the mount and possibly gusts of wind that come along while you're taking an exposure. So the star field that we're handing to our autofocus routine from an SCT is quite a bit different than the star field we're handing to the same autofocus routine uh, from one of our refractors. This variation here did make me wonder if perhaps I was dealing with a collimation issue because I'm I'm seeing one thing on one side of focus and something else on the other side of focus so maybe collimation is the problem. With collimation what you want to do is take a bright star, center it in the field of view, and then really defocus the star so that you can get the image of the the shadow of the center obstruction in your defocus star and this is kind of what you would have. What you want to see for a good collimation is that the or the center obstruction circle is centered in the outer circle of light for your main or primary mirror. So what I've done is to form two circles here that are concentric and when I overlay that on the image that we're just looking at there but zoomed in you can see that they the two circles match the image quite well. And so while there could be a number of problems in causing focus, I don't believe collimation is one of those here. So I can take that off the books as a consideration for why it is I keep getting these inconsistent results. One of the tests that I recently did after focusing with the Batonoff mask and finding the optimum focus to be around this 460, 17, 466, 17, 470 range, I went through uh, the out of focus region and moved the focuser manually through these steps all the way back through optimum focus and then out of focus on the other side and recorded the corresponding half flux radius which I also include in the file name here when I take the pictures from Nina. So these Nina numbers here that correspond to half flux radius are just these numbers over here in the file name and the half flux radius algorithm used to assess the image and to place the numbers in the file name is the same algorithm used in the autofocus routine. So these are the same numbers that would be used by the Nina autofocus routine to evaluate focus for this series of focus positions. Now I also gave these same files over to PixInsight in the subframe selector process and it gave me numbers for the full width at half maximum gave the files over to ASTAP and it gave me some half flux diameter numbers and then I used astrophotography tool to load in each one of these images and in this column I collected the half flux diameter for a single bright star in the image and then here I got the half flux diameter for the full image and the corresponding full width at half maximum for the full image. Now one thing that sort of irritates me as an engineer uh, with astrophotography tool is why are these numbers different? Why is there a, a factor of two on this half flux diameter? Why is this half flux diameter twice the size of two to three times the size of the full width at half maximum? If anything, the number of a the half flux diameter should be a smaller number than the full width at half maximum. Astrophotography tool has just introduced the inverse power method for assessing focus, and it's based on the Fourier method. But I took their metric for the inverse power approach and put them in here as well. Now we're not going to go through all of these numbers, but something very surprising to me came out of these numbers when I took a look at them. For example, here's the Nina half flux radius numbers for this series of images I got. Very random. Uh, I would say there is the hint of a hyperbolic curve on one side and then I get crap on the other side. The thing that surprised me is, is that when I plotted up the astrophotography tool inverse power numbers, I got this graph. See anything surprising? These two graphs are almost a mirror image of each other. I don't know why that is. But the metrics that I'm getting out of the half flux radius, which presumably is a completely different algorithm than the algorithm that astrophotography has implemented in their inverse power method, is totally different. Yet they're providing numbers that have exactly the same kind of trends. That's very surprising. There's probably a story in there somewhere. 
I just don't know what it is. Before we go on, I want to uh, point out that the, the folks, the developers who are users of Astrophotography Tool, have recently published their method in a referee journal. And this is a big accomplishment for anybody. Get Publishing an article, a technical article, in a referee journal is a big deal. It takes a lot of time. There's generally a panel of subject matter experts who review your work, who comment on your work, who say, yes, you did this, but you didn't do that. Now go back and check this. Did you verify that? There is a lot of back and forth uh, to get a technical paper published in a refereed journal. Kudos to them for jumping through the hoops and getting that published. And I'll post a link to this paper in the description of the video just so you can download it. It is a bit mathy. Uh, that's okay. I'm looking forward to reading it. And I'm really curious of what they did and commend them for having a technical approach that has been reviewed and vetted and is deemed worthy of publication. So that's quite quite a big step and quite a feather in their cap for accomplishing that. Let's go back to the table, but look at the data in another way. This is the data that I was just showing you from the Nina Half Flux Radius. And it would tell you if you fit a hyperbola to it, and you can fit a hyperbola, just about anything, like I said, it'll give you a number that's 17480 is the uh, optimum focus point. You shouldn't believe this number because you got it from a hyperbola fit. You need to look at the data and do the data fall mostly on the curve. And you can see here that for all intents and purposes, these look totally uncorrelated. So there's no reason at all to believe this number out of this hyperbolic curve fit. Now let's take a look at the APT results, not the inverse power method, which would basically provide the same number, but instead let's take a look at what I'm getting from a half flux diameter metric out of astrophotography tool. Now you can see that the data here look different. Yes, I've still got quite a bit of scatter here, more than I would like and certainly more than I see with my refractors, but at least I do see a high half flux diameter when I'm out of focus on one side and a high half flux diameter when I'm out of focus on the other side. So at least there's that symmetry that I'm looking for and not seeing in the uh, half flux radius metrics that I'm getting from Nina at this point. And now when I do the curve fit, it tells me that there, the focus point is 17,469, which actually is very close to what I'm getting with the Batnoff mask. So even with all of this variability and data points scattered around this curve fit, the curve fit has done a good job of quieting that noise to the point where it actually gives me a good focus number. So it's very surprising to me that astrophotography tools half flux diameter algorithm is providing a better hyperbolic trend and critical focus point than what I'm getting from Nina. As I said, I'm getting very inconsistent and generally poor results with the Nina autofocus routine on my SCT. It's worked great on my short focal length refractors, no problems there. And I'm hoping to get the same kind of uh, confidence out of it with my SCT. I just don't know what I'm doing to create the problems that I'm getting right now. It is true that long focal length star morphology shape differs from what I get from a refractor. There are fewer stars, the stars are larger, they're fainter, the out of focus stars have a hole in them. So it's not the same star field that you get with a refractor. And that I suspect is a, a key problem here in terms of being able to properly characterize the star shape for these autofocus routines. The focus curves I'm currently getting out of the uh, Nina half flux radius estimates show an asymmetry in the curve. I'm getting low and generally more variability half flux radius on one side of focus and generally pretty good range of half flux radius out of the other side of focus. That is a fundamental problem because the, the data don't look like hyperbola. There are possible mechanical causes. I talked about collimation, but I checked that, and that seems to be okay. There could be uh, some primary mirror tilt as I'm focusing. I don't know how to check that, and I certainly don't know how to fix it, so I hope that's not the issue. Uh, there could be some physical slip between the focus motor and the SCT focus shaft. I don't trust the, S the Celestron focus motor that much, so that certainly could be it. And I could tighten up the set screw between them that links the, those two items together. Those are very difficult to verify. I think uh, that the likely cause appears to be related to how half-flux radius is estimated in these algorithms and that the star field that I'm giving it with my SCT is just not fitting how the algorithm is expecting to see a star. On the good side, I do have a little bit of good news. If you've followed this channel for long, you noticed that way back when, when I first got this focuser, I was having trouble with it coming detached from the back end of the scope. 
and one of the fixes that I finally settled on was to replace the stock screws with longer screws and use Loctite and so far the uh, Loctited longer screws seem to be keeping that Celestron focus motor attached to the back of my SCT. So I've done a lot of uh, focusing, a lot of movement of the focuser back and forth, and it's still staying attached. My next step is that I'm going to install the Hocus Focus Nina plug-in. I've already installed it, but I think I have to wait until clear skies before I can actually test it and then try to adjust the parameters so that it properly identifies stars in an SCT generated star field. And so once I do that, uh, that should provide a more consistent measure of the star morphology and hopefully that will play into the autofocus routine and give me more consistent autofocus results. So once I get some of that data, I'll be sure and share it with you and let you know how that's working out. Until then, clear skies and I'll talk to you later. See ya.